Rewind. Your Week in Review is sponsored by the Wisconsin Realtors Association. Bringing Wisconsin communities to life with great homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. The Wisconsin Realtors Association, the voice of real estate. This week on Rewind, your week in review. Voters decide that Justice Daniel Kelly and Judge Jill Karofsky will face off April 7 for a 10-year term on the Supreme Court. We have 13 bills, the majority of them bipartisan, um, unanimous. In a kumbaya moment, Republicans and Democrats pass a 10 million clean water package, and Governor Tony Evers is expected to sign it. But what will Evers do with a $392 million package of income tax and personal property tax cuts that Republicans put on his desk? Assembly Republicans passed tough-on-crime bills as they met for what they said will be the final time this year. All this and Wispolitik stock picks on the February 21 edition of Rewind, your week in review. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. Before we get to all the lawmaking at the end of a session week, which is really busy, there, there, in addition to all that, there was a primary election. Yes. So let's talk about that first. The primary election for the Supreme Court, our two finalists moving on to April 7th, uh, Justice Dan Kelly and Dane County Judge Jill Karofsky, uh, Marquette University, Ed Fallone finished third. Um, just your overall impressions of that. I, I do want to go a little deeper, but go so ahead. So remember we talked about this a few weeks ago with like Kelly getting up on TV first. The idea was as a show of strength, his financial advantage, that he wanted to maybe run up the score a little bit, get to 52, 53, 54 percent. That could send a message of this guy has crossover appeal, he's in a strong position in the April pri- uh, general election because it's a much different electorate come April. He got to 50, yeah. but just 50.13 or 50.17. So, which, you know, in a three way race, I'd rather be at 50 percent than not, right? Yeah. But it's not a dominant performance that says this guy is really in a great position for April. So if you're an outside group, how do you feel about investing in him right now? Um, how do you feel about that April electorate? Because I have seen no signs so far, or people I had talked to have not seen the signs, of the presidential primary for, for Democrats petering out before April. It is going to be an all-hands-on-deck war, maybe through the Wisconsin convention. It's still going to be relevant. Well, That means supercharged Dem turnout. You know, So Kelly faces a difficult environment. And yes, he, good show, you know, good to be at 50, but not dominant going in that different environment. Okay, and I want to go deeper in three ways, JR. You and I looked at the totals. About 702,000 votes mm-hmm. were cast in that Supreme Court primary, up significantly from our last three-way primary, point one. Point two, if you look at the unofficial totals, uh, Jill Karofsky only won 10 counties, Madison, Dane, Milwaukee, et cetera, the predictable one. Mm-hmm. Point three, after the, after the um, primary results, Kelly and Karofsky, Fallone said, I'm going to do all I can to elect Karofsky. If you total up his 89,000, add that to Karofsky's 261,000, you are within less than 2,000 of mm-hmm. the Kelly total. Now, is that significant or is it not significant because of what you just said? We're also going to have presidential primary Democrat and, yes, Mr. Trump on the Republican side. If it were any other April, yeah, I mean, it would be significant that those results. But this is not any other April. It is a an April with a presidential primary on the ballot, and that's going to drive things. Now, look at what happened on Tuesday. You had primaries for county executive and mayor of Milwaukee. That helped boost turnout. We'll go to those next. You had the 7th Congressional District. That had a primary that was, we saw $2.8 million in independent expenditures in that Republican primary. That helped boost turnout in a quite Republican area. So that actually helped Kelly. Um, but the election was totally different come April. Now, Trump has done well in Iowa, New Hampshire, for being an incumbent with no real challenge. Better numbers than Obama got in 12, for example, when he was running for re-election without really a, a true opponent. But they don't match the Dem turnout numbers. And so the electorate we're going to see in April will be so different that the results from Tuesday don't really matter a whole lot. Now, the caveats are, um, can Republicans use this as a, a turnout, you know, tune-up? for November and really drive game. turnout. The ground game. Will voters who are really deep Trump supporters who are unhappy about impeachment and everything else turn out just the chance to vote for Trump even with nobody else on the ballot because he has no primary opponent in Wisconsin. So like some of them could go to the Democratic primary. Excuse me. They could play there. A little mischief making. Maybe. But those are the factors you've got to watch. And what kind of money does, does Kelly now pull in okay. from outside groups to, get, to do things? I, so I think he, there's a path. It's just not a very narrow. As a, it's a narrow one for him right now, unless okay. 
that primary dynamic change between now and April 7th. Okay, either Justice Kelly or Judge Karofsky will win a 10-year uh, term on the state Supreme Court on April 7th. So th your takeaway, JR, is that maybe the Kelly campaign isn't as happy as they'd hoped to be? I mean, I, I, again, I would feel good being at 50 in a three-way primary. Yeah. But now the question is, it's a totally different electorate. What can he do to fight against that tide? And I don't want to make sound like he has no chance. That is not what I'm trying to say at all. But it's a it looks like a difficult environment, and even Republicans tell me, look, there's a reason why GOP lawmakers talked about moving the presidential race off of the April ballot at one point a year and a half ago, because they knew the challenge that Kelly faced. They dropped the idea, but this is why they, they toyed with the idea of moving it. Okay. Now, now let's move on to some of those other primaries. Uh, you talked about the 7th Congressional District. Uh, Republican Tom Tiffany, a state senator, will be the nominee, nominee for the May special election. And Democrat Tricia Zunker will be the Democratic nominee. Let's just look inside those vote totals. Uh, senator Tiffany got 57% of the vote. Jason Church, first-time candidate, 42%. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tricia Zunker got 88% versus Lawrence Dale. There was a question about his residency. He didn't really run a pretty effective campaign. Your t any takeaways on the 7th before we go to Milwaukee County? A couple things. One, a lot bigger turnout for Republicans in that primary than Democrats. Not surprised because of the um, amount of money spent. Two, Tiffany is going to be the favorite going into the May 12th special election. It's a Trump district. The best hope for Democrats is that they have a supercharged Democratic base. Republicans get complacent and fall asleep ahead of the May election. Now, I think Republicans learned their lesson from SD10 in January of 18, when Petty Schottner, Democrat, won a Western Wisconsin Senate district that Trump won by 17 points just 14 months earlier. So they feel like they're not going to do that again. Long as Tiffany pays attention, is engaged, and turns people out, I think he's, I get the impression he's the favorite. But you just got to watch that because if Zunker, if she gets close even, it'll send shockwaves nationally because this is Trump territory. You'd expect a Trump backer to do well in that race. Okay, now let's look at uh, the race for, uh, for Mil Milwaukee County Executive. Chris Abley uh, is retiring. And um, State Representative David Crowley, uh, an African American, and State Senator Chris Larson from, I think, South Milwaukee will be on the April 7 ballot. Is Crowley a favorite because he is being backed financially by Mr. Abley's PACs? Well, a couple things. Um, one, Larson ran before. Uh, actually beat Chris Abley in the primary four years ago, but then lost by like a dozen points in the April election. Larson did about 10, 12 points worse in this primary than he did against Larson, or Abley, four years ago. Now, the difference was you had a four-way primary this time versus last time it was one-on-one, -on -one, him and Abley. So if you're anti-Abley, you went to Larson. Larson's benefit, or his pluses are, he's run before, he has name ID, he's got a progressive network in Milwaukee County, and oh, by the way, that primary for president, again, if it's supercharged and there's a big Bernie turnout, or, or Warren, like Bernie and Warren voters are probably going to be Chris Larson voters. They come the same progressive wing of the party. The flip side is, there are Republicans in Milwaukee County, a lot of them. If you're a Republican or a moderate, Crowley can say, look, yes, I am a Democrat, but I'm not as far to the left on the spectrum as Larson is, so you Republicans, you moderates, you can feel comfortable with me. Um, also, Crowley could pick off some of Larson's Democratic support because remember, Larson went from like f above 50 in the primary to you know 36 ish, 37, so okay. some drop off. The Abley money is the big kind of X factor. Abley spent 240 grand plus to help Crowley in the primary. If he'll help them with by that much in the primary, what will he spend in the general election? Abley has a big checkbook. The problem with Abley's checkbook is it's not always been successful. He's backed people before and, and lost, so that money is sometimes not effective. So while Crowley struck a theme right away on Tuesday of, I can build bridges, Larson's was, we're tired of rich people buying elections in Wisconsin. Kind of a little jab at the Abley money right away. Okay, and just to clarify, both Mr. Crowley and Senator Larson got in the 30s? Yes. Okay. Within right. a couple points of each other. Okay, moving on. Uh, Milwaukee Bear Tom Barrett wants a fifth term. He'll be opposed by State Senator Lena Taylor. Um, any surprises in, in, in the, the totals for the city of Milwaukee mayor? Well, primary? if you're a four-term mayor who's won convincingly all four times, yeah. you'd kind of want to do better than 50% in a three-way primary. Now, caveats, uh, four years ago, four-way primary, uh, Barrett was less than 50%. One was 70% winning up for April ballot. Um, 
Lena got through the primary with 31% of the vote. She does not have the financial resources right now to compete with the 900 grand that Barrett had in the bank before the primary. He didn't really run a lot of stuff ahead of the primary, maybe saving it for the general because he'd overwhelm her with resources. So the things that Lena could be looking for, you have David Crowley running for county executive, Jason Fields running for a comptroller, Lena running for mayor. That could supercharge African-American turnout in April because um, they have several African-American, pr prominent African-American camps running high profile offices. Also the city attorney, I think, um, the guy that finished first, I think he's also African American. So that might be an incentive for higher black turnout, which if you look at the numbers traditionally in Milwaukee County, black turnout is much higher in November than it is in April. So that's something to watch. Um, but can she marshal the resources to take advantage of that anti-Barrett vote? People aren't really thrilled with them. If you are, again, there are Republicans in Milwaukee, in the city of Milwaukee, is leaning to win them over? You know, probably not. I mean, Barrett's knock has always been he's just a nice, he's a nice guy. And Lena had run for what before? She ran for county executive That's in 2008 against Walker. Yeah, um, thank So you. Barrett's knock has been a nice guy, but what's the fire? What's the vision for this city? Um, good guy, but does he really excite you? Um, I don't know there's enough of that, though, to beat him in April. Okay. New subject. The... Um, the, the, the Republicans came out with their version of a uh, tax package that totals $392.4 million. Now, of that, $274.7 million in income tax cuts. The average person would get a tax cut of 106. Mm -hmm. If you're married filing jointly, that's 145. Uh, other provision, 44.7 million cut in personal property taxes paid by businesses, 100 million payment on the state debt, and this is in contrast to what Governor Evers called a special session on. Let's use a surplus to boost K-12 aids and to indirectly reduce property taxes. Um, the the million dollar question, is he going to sign this? Because, I, uh, were you surprised? Two Democrats, mm -hmm. Steve Doyle of Onalaska and uh, Nick Milray of South, uh, South Range, both targeted by Republicans on November 3, voted for it. So now it's a bipartisan, barely package. Uh, I know we're not in the punditry business, but what's the over and under on whether he signs it? Uh, I, most people I've talked to think he's going to veto it. Really? The thing that I heard going into Tuesday was watch the roll calls. If you have in the Senate um, Jennifer Schilling and Patty Schottner, who are the top targets for Republicans this fall, if they voted for it. If you look in the Assembly, what, along with Doyle, Milroy up north, Beth Myers right next door up north, yeah. Robin Viney and Wabatosa, if they voted for it, then Evers would have to kind of think about signing it because with the budget, remember, mm -hmm. all the Democrats voted against it and then Evers vetoed it, which means that Democrats now have to cheer Tony Evers when he talks about the tax cuts that are in the budget they didn't support, right. cheer him when he talks about the, the education spending in a budget they didn't support. You couldn't do it to him again in that position. So the feeling is because that they didn't let, let off that many Democrats, he will likely veto it. Now, with Doyle and Milroy, I asked him, you know, why'd you support it? Doyle said he's hoping that if the governor vetoes this, they'll have a conversation about a compromise. He wants to see a, a compromise. I don't know that's going to happen. From talking to people, it seems like if Evers vetoes it, money goes in the till, they use it next budget um, and call it a day. Milroy said he wants to do something with the money. He thinks there's a surplus. You should either invest it or turn it, give it back. He wanted to do something. It probably gives him a little bit of, you know, cover come November. They're still going to get knocked about taxes, though, because it's the, it's one, it's the standard line on Dems in general, right? Their taxes spend liberals. Two, they voted against a budget with a tax cut in it, so I'm not sure how much benefit they get from this vote. But in the sound clip we're about to hear from Senate debate on the tax cut package, uh, Senator, Senator Darling says, look, he v vetoed one middle, middle class tax cut, and here he's going to veto another one. It's just pretty interesting. Okay, time to hear from Senator Erpenbach arguing for the governor's original special session plan, and Senator Darling responded. Governor Evers ran on this very issue, and he beat Scott Walker. He ran on school funding. Nobody should be shocked that this is what Governor Evers wants to do with a surplus. We continue to lead the nation or come close to leading the nation with high property taxes, which, by the way, I don't think 
is a fair way to pay for schools anymore. It's time we start paying for some of those unfunded mandates. And that's what Governor Evers is proposing. He is proposing the responsible, fiscally right thing to do. And when he was running for office, he said his, one of his priorities, main priorities, was to give a middle class tax cut. We did that, and then he vetoed it. We're doing it again with the surplus money we have. Only zero eight districts pay for their referendums. And that's not the majority of our property tax payers. So let's help our small businesses grow. Because when they do, they employ more people, they have more revenues, they spend more money, and our, our state thrives. So let's just get the economics of this straight. Okay. Uh- before we go to the next topic, JR, just a PS on that. You were noting that uh, Robin Vining, who mm-hmm. had won a, a traditional GOP seat, voted no. Uh, Vruink voted no. Uh, Myers voted no. And Doyle and Milroy voted yes. D- you, so you had a PS one of the, on that? That cover we talked about? Yeah. For Robin Vining, for example, you can say, look, back in my district, schools are going to referendum. Like, they want, they need this money. This is a way to. I voted for education spending, and that's your message, right? Kay. I voted for it because the Dems tried to swap out the GOP plan with the governor's plan. It was voted down. It's a procedural thing. They say, I supported a plan that would have boosted education funding while cutting our property taxes. So that's, yeah. their, that's their line they're going to use. Okay, new subject. Um, in this week, there, there were about 12 or 14 tougher on crime bills authored by the Republicans floating back and forth. And I've been working with the office of Representative San Filippo and one of his staff aides, and I'm trying to compile a list of what I really do believe is now in the governor's office uh, desk, excuse me, that both houses have passed. So I just want to walk through four bills that <laughs> I really hope I'm right here that, that are on the governor's desk. One, judicial approval when a charge, w- when a charge of felon in possession of firearm is dismissed. Two, Canceling early release from probation or parole for anyone convicted of violent crime or sexual assault of a child. Three, making it a felony to intimidate a witness who is a victim of domestic abuse. And four, requiring the Department of Corrections to end probation and parole or extended supervision of anyone accused, not convicted, accused of a new crime. Um, are you more convinced, Jr., that the governor is going to veto these because they do increase our prison population? Mm-hmm. There are costs. The governor and uh, Evan Goike and other and Lena Taylor want criminal justice reform that reduces, not increases, the number of prison inmates. Uh, is it a slam dunk? The go- slam dunk that the, the governor is going to veto these tougher on crimes? They're all party line. I think they're all party line votes. The ones that had roll calls, if I remember correctly. Um, it does not look like the governor has signed them. His secretary, his correction secretary, testified against them yes. in committee, especially with revoking parole, talking about how it would increase prison costs. Yes, They're talking about increases that would require building new prisons, essentially, just to hold the people who would be off of parole if this, these things took effect. So I just don't get the impression talking to so far that they're going to, the governor has signed these bills. But it's important to say that one of the four, 12 or 14 bills would say that if you're convicted of vehicle theft, mandatory 30, 30 days in jail. Mm-hmm. If you're a third offense shoplifter, mandatory six months in jail. And here's my point. Those bills are not on the governor's desk. No. And so we're trying to keep track of what is being passed and what's still alive for when the Senate comes back. Excuse One me. overwhelming support that was um, providing $5 million to, in grants, additional grants to yes. local governments to pay Long for. proposal. Pay for, I think, yeah, uh, to pay for increasing policing grants for car theft and carjacking. That passed. I mean, it's more money for locals, so, you know, I think that might get done, but a lot of these other ones, just not. Didn't that $5 million just pass the Senate? Just through the Senate, not through the Assembly yet. Right. And the Assembly's gone, so I'm not sure. I lost track of that bill yesterday. Right. Yeah, we lost track (laughs) of a few bills because the Assembly passed dozens of of them. Okay, but in my open, I, I referred to that kumbaya moment where you have uh, agreement between Democratic, uh, Democrats, legislators, and I believe the governor is going to sign this. This is a $10 million bipartisan package on clean water. Let's just walk through uh, a few of the things it does. It creates a state office of water policy, hires more county conservation officers, increases grants to property owners with contaminated wells, lays the groundwork for a new fight on nitrates, which are increasingly being found uh, uh, in uh, Wisconsin groundwater. Um, The 
Republican who chaired the Clean Water Task Force made this prediction. Um, Governor Evers will sign any bill that gets to his desk. Before we hear from uh, Novak and Shanklin, NEPS on clean water. Just when we get to the Senate, that's still the issue. I mean, it's a $10 million pri- roughly $10 million price tag on all these bills. Uh, Fitzgerald still got to pick through what he wants to do with all these pieces of legislation coming over from the Assembly because they got one day they're starting to come in in March. Yep. Is it March 20? I can't remember exactly what day it is. Anyway, Senate's but coming back one day and then they're going to go home. And what do they want to spend? That's the question. Because there's this, there's homelessness, there's there are any number of spending bills that have, have stacked up in the uh, hopper for the Senate. They haven't indicated yet what they want to do. Okay. Let's listen to uh, Representative uh, Katrina Shanklin, who was vice chair of the Clean Water Task Force. And as I said, Representative uh, Novak, who was chair, uh, as they debated, as they commissioned and sent off to the Senate the clean water package. What I want to focus on is what we should do next, because today is not the end, it's the beginning. If this is the last thing we do on water quality in the legislature, now or ever, then we have failed. Today is an excellent building block for future action, as long as that future action comes. Water contamination has been in the decades in the making, and it's going to take some time to get there. Did we get everything we wanted? No, we didn't. Um, But it's compromise, it's talk, it's discussion. And as I've said, this is just the start. This is not the end. Um, I would have loved to do more, but um, we just couldn't get there, and I plan to... uh, uh, do that next session, start off where we left off. JR, the governor uh, and some legislators have made it a priority to w- work cut drug prices. Mm-hmm. So there's this bill that was, uh, it's been a long time being crafted and um, adopted by the assembly. It would regulate pharmacy benefit managers. And um, according to the uh, news story I read, pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs, negotiate drug prices for insurers and employers, manage plans, and process claims. So before I uh, ask you to explain the significance, because you followed this bill more than me, some of the provisions. They would, uh, the, the bill would offer more consumer and small pharmacy protections, more transparency in, in prescription pricing process, require insurance commissioner to regulate pharmacy benefit managers, and uh, finally, allow pharmacists to tell consumers about cheaper options, including paying cash if it's less than the copay. Um, okay, I have told you all I know about okay. this bill. Give me the background, the back and forth. So PBMs are a, a middleman between the drug manufacturers and pharmacies. Do I ever interact with them when I pick up my prescriptions? Uh, well, they are negotiating on both sides. They're trying to squeeze both sides on prices, right? Got it. There are federal regulations for PBMs, but the state office of, cons- of insurance or commissioner does not have any authority over them. The original version of the bill had a hundred co-sponsors. That's rare in that building for something that would do well, as much as the original version did. What happened, though, was that as this worked through the process, more concerns were raised by various people they had to craft something that would get through both houses. S- Speaker Robin Voss, tell you how important this was, got personally involved in the discussions. Um, the bill that they produced does not go as far as the original one. So, for some examples, um, if you are um, going to a, a PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager, they can dictate to you which pharmacy you can use. Yes. Like, you know, uh, even a mail order one, or uh, which sometimes they own. The original bill had changes to that that was taken out. So there are things like that that advocates wanted more, but during the hearing on the bill, Joe Sanfilippo, the chair of the health committee, said, look, yes, you guys wanted more, but the reality of the legislative process is we had to make changes to get through the other body, i.e. the Senate. Um, This is a step in the right direction, so we have something more we have right now, but it's not everything that consumers wanted, and the Democrats complained, we are shortchanging consumers with this, now that's their opinion, but they felt like they could have gotten more, especially when you start out with 130, 100 co-sponsors out of 130 members of the, of the legislature. Right. Well, okay, it's a very complex subject. Does this allow either side to say that this could lead to controlling drug prices? No, I'm not saying lowering, but controlling? Uh, well, see, that was part of the rub because there were concerns that raised that what they're doing might actually raise prices some way. And yeah. I, so it, you're getting the weeds of what this bill would do, but... I think they feel, the, the backers feel like it's a first step 
Okay. But not the last step they want to take on this issue. Okay. And um, I, I put it on the schedule today because the Assembly did pass it, mm -hmm. and it finally gives us a chance to talk about um, a bill that actually cleared one house of the legislature. Okay. Uh, you're up with stock report. All right. Uh, rising up 35s. We got a report from the Air Force this week. Mm. All kinds of concern in Madison about the noise of these new airplanes. Um, Madison is still a preferred option for housing these new planes, and it looks like they're going to end up here despite the opposition from some people over the noise. Okay. Mick Stosh Krasinski. So remember back in December. Representative Stosh serving his first term. Uh, he had a verified complaint for sexual harassment against him from Human Resources because he harassed a staffer at an off-site event. Um, at the time, when I talked to people, they thought, that's it. Uh, you're talking about this Me Too environment with Democrats. How does he survive a primary, can even survive, stay in office? Because remember, Democratic leaders, including Gordon Hintz, the Assembly Minor Leader, um, Ben Wickler, the State Party Chair, called on him to resign. He has withheld, withstood that initial onslaught. Now he has a primary challenger, a uh, member of the Green Bay School, School Board, Board. She also works for the Greater YMCA of Green, Green Greater, YMCA of Greater Green Bay. She, in her announcement, said, uh, "We need new leadership because of what happened and what he was found to have done." But when I talked to people, the feedback I got was, "Look, um, he actually may be the favorite to win the primary because time has passed." I'm also Amanda Stuck, who's leaving the Assembly to run for Congress. She has kind of said that she believes Stosh should get a second chance. Um, she's going to do a kickoff event with him next month, I believe, for his campaign. There is a sense that there might be a path for him now with the watch. One, um, he used to be a state political director for conservation voters, I believe. Um, do the backers who support him before, donors, do they stay with him? Yeah. That's one thing to watch. Um, two, you know, what happens with his caucus? Remember, he, they wanted him gone. So there are some people who think, well, if he wins this fall, maybe they'll welcome him back. I've talked to at least a couple female members of the Assembly Democrat Caucus saying, we don't want him back. In fact, I expect some of those caucus members to go up to Green Bay in August, spend some of their summer campaigning against him. Wow. The issue, though, is, is the anger about what he did really in Madison in the capital circles, or is it being felt back home in Green Bay? That's something to watch. And then don't forget, there is a primary, a, a race up there for a state Senate seat. Um, that Democrats need want to hold on to because Dave Hansen is retiring to improve their chances of not get let Republicans get to a two thirds majority in the Senate. Can this race bleed over into that? And oh, by the way, it's a quite dim seat. Uh, Clinton won it by 13.3 points in 2016. But if Stosh gets to the primary, how does it impact the general election? Do you open the door to a Mike Sheridan situation to go you know, way back way when machine? Mike Sharon was Assembly Speaker, Democrat in Janesville, had several issues. One of them was a relationship with a, a lobbyist, lobbyist that yes. killed okay. him in a very Democratic seat. There are all kinds of layers of this story that we got to watch from now until August. We do. And you got so excited about that, you got 20 seconds right. for your falling. So, okay, I've seen this play before, Steve. You get a bill in the 800s for its number, it's last minute, there's a big push to do it, and it falls apart in the end because they can't quite get on board. I remember the sighting of large animal operations was a factor in Brad Foff being rejected as DATCAP secretary. This bill was pushed last minute, got pulled from the calendar because it fell apart in the end. Okay, um, we only got a minute left, but uh, one of the most amazing bills is this bill that would raise the drinking age till, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, bar time till four o'clock. Now, two hours. During two hours. The, during the DNC, mm -hmm. what's the latest version of it? Real quickly. Okay. They paired it back. It was going to be statewide yes. to make everybody happy because also I said, why should I vote for something that only impacts Milwaukee? Right. It's back to 14 counties. It doesn't Did have it pass the assembly? It passed the assembly. It's got amendments on it. But now the question is, will the Senate go along with it? There was a different version that was pulled, the, that was brought up yes. uh, to Wednesday during the Senate. Okay. People like Van Wongard said, no, I don't like the idea of the increased drunk driving. Retired police officer. Here's what to watch. Okay. Scott Fitzgerald's had a rule for a long time. He needs 17 GOP votes to pass anything, right? Scott Fitzgerald, we think, is going to be out of there in about nine, ten months because he's in a great position to win a congressional seat. Yes. Does he say, look, the business community, um, people are pressuring you this being, does he say, heck with it, let's just get this thing done and out of here because it's not just about the DNC. Okay. It's about, can, will Republicans come in the future? Other big 
this is about can we put a good party on? I know it sounds silly, two hours, of, but no, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a perception. Everybody thing. can relate to that issue. Okay, just uh, two programming notes on Monday. I'll be interviewing officials of the State Department of Health Services on our flu season and corona coronavirus in in Wisconsin, and I'll also do a. Set a, a show on how international trade, how has it changed now that we have a China deal and a new deal with Mexico and Canada? And one of the panelists will be former Governor Scott McCallum. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. That's Re Rewind for February 21. Rewind, your week in review, is sponsored by the Wisconsin Realtors Association. Bringing Wisconsin communities to life with great homes, businesses, and neighborhoods. The Wisconsin Realtors Association, the voice of real estate.